so up next, we have Charles Ennis. Uh, Charles is the first vice president of the RESC and a member of the Sunshine Coast Center in Seashelt, which has operated an observatory for public viewing since June of 2015. He's the author of Building a Small Observatory, published by the RESC in 2016. And he's here to talk to us about building a small observatory. So Charles. Thank you. Let's get right down to sharing here. Come on, here we go. Okay. This is a slide of Jack Newton, who is, I think, the current record holder amongst all the people I've spoken to for building small observatories as an amateur. I think it's 15 that he's built so far. He's been a very good resource for me. Back in 2016, the Society published uh, the book that I wrote for them to, to raise funds for the Society, Building a Small Observatory, Lessons for Builders. And right now, I'm in the process of trying to um, update that. The, the original objective was to learn from the experience of others so that people didn't make the mistakes that we made when we were doing our observatories. In the, the very first instance, I was talking to people from 10 different countries, 110 of them. It's now up to 207 observatory owners in 14 countries, and the smallest simplest liftoff roofs like this little shed here in the Netherlands and Remy Lacasse's Belvedere Observatory, which is a roll-off closet basically, to a guy that's got an awful lot of money. This is the Gemma Observatory on a rocky promontory in New Hampshire. It was uh, designed by and Mahan Winton Architects in Boston. It won the 2017 American Institute of Architects Small Projects Award. The owner who I have met, who I have spoken to, it wishes to remain anonymous. But this is what you got if you got millions to spend. This thing is completely covered with uh, sheet sink. It's got a turret that turns at the top. It's got a, a deck at the back where he has another telescope. This is the interior and all of the uh, amenities that he's got. So if we're talking telescopes and observatories, who is building them? Amateurs, about 92% of them are built by people who identify as amateurs, astronomers. Are they part of a club? 64% of the people I've dealt with are, 7.5% were. How many have you built? About 60% have said that they've built one observatory, about 32.8% two, and about 64 say, yeah, don't ask. That would be where Jack, the category that Jack's in. What size telescopes do we have? They range from two inch refractors to 25 inch reflectors. Here's the breakdown. Basically the principal ones are 14 inch and eight inch, but you can see none of them really has a, a, a very large uh, portion of the percentage It's spread all over the map. Why did you build it? Most people, they were tired of taking the thing down and putting it up again over and over again. The second most common reason was people wanted to do astrophotography and they wanted a really uh, solid platform to do that. And the small portion, this is mostly like RASC centers and so on, they wanted to serve the community. Where did you build your observatory? 68.9% built it at home. This is my friend Erwin Diener who has a dome and a roof of his home down in Roberts Creek. And 24% built it on other property and 10% roughly a club site or astronomy park, and we'll come back to that. Some of them, and here's Jack again, are involved in astrotourism. That's his wonderful astronomy B&B up on Anarchist Mountain outside of Soyuz, and he also has a place down in the astronomy village, or the Sky Village in Arizona. So why did they build it where they built it? I thought that people were going to tell me they built it there because of a dark sky, but only 34.8% built in a particular location because of that. Most people built where they built it because they owned the property. It was a financial thing. This is what they could afford to do. And 56% of the people who did that said that they did believe they had the dark sky when they began. But the problem is sky glow began encroaching at 32%. And that's up from when I originally wrote this book. It was only about 20 
7% to begin with. But there were people out there like Kunihiko Okano, who's got these two observatories on his balcony in Tokyo, which is not exactly a place you consider a, a dark sky. The number of observatories on an individual site, 75%, there's only one, but there are examples like Mer Mervyn here uh, down in Tasmania who has two. And you do, as I've mentioned earlier, have astronomy parks. Here you've got uh, the Australian Outback where uh, a bunch of Australian astronomers have set up their, their astronomy camp. You've got United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. You've got Orion Optical Road Imaging and you've got Sierra Remote Observatories. And that's quite a big operation. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. You'll see why. 65% of the people designed the observatory themselves. This is Adrian who designed the uh, observatory for my Sunshine Coast Center. A lot of them were converted garden sheds, like you see here with uh, Mike Rushton and uh, Keith Rickard in, in the UK. Just over half are manual, but there are some really interesting automated setups. This is Dr. David Lane's uh, dome observatory. And you'll see here that there are little cards with barcodes on it, and there is a, a grocery store laser scanner there. And as the dome turns past, the scanner reads the card and it tells you exactly how far your dome has turned. It's quite a clever setup. Most of the people who built small observatories had go-to telescopes. And most of them are powered in, are plugged into a power source. My Sunshine Coast Observatory, which you see here, is totally off-grid and, and solar. But that's a very small percentage of the observatories out there. Who built it? Only a small percentage, 22%, actually built it entirely themselves. Many of them incorporated helpers and or contractors for at least part of the work. Some of them, like that Gemma Observatory you saw earlier, had a contractor build the entire thing. Who built the stuff inside? Well, 73% had some part in building components for the uh, system inside of the observatory. These are electronics that one of the members of my Sunshine Coast Center, Mike Bradley, put together. Was the telescope built or purchased? 84.5% purchased their telescope. And if you're wondering what that goofy sign on the pillar says, here's a close up. Objects and telescope are farther than they appear. He has a sense of humor, our friend Mark here. Was the observatory built for an existing telescope? In most cases, yes, it was. And was it used for remote viewing? 59.7% of the small observatory owners that I've spoken to operate their, their observatory remotely, but that's usually from an office in their home and the observatory is in the backyard. What do you use it for? 32% said they use it for visual viewing, 61% astrophotography, 44% science. And you'll notice that doesn't add up to 100%. That's because people often use the telescopes in their observatories for multiple purposes. Public or private, 68% of the small observatory owners I spoke to have private observatories. Some public, 22%. Uh, this guy here you see, that's actually a public observatory with that sky shed. So here's the thing that, that was the big challenge. Did anything go wrong? And 11% vowed and declared that nothing did. And I'm a retired police detective. I tried to get all these people on Skype to interview them because I could tell when they're holding out on me. And I didn't put people's names in if they screwed up. I just wanted the errors so that none of the rest of us would have the same mistake. This is actually a picture of an observatory in Arizona where you figured putting electrical outlets in the floor would work until there was a rainstorm and it flooded. One of the most common problems was foundations, people failing to put their foundations deep enough to get below the frost so that you didn't get frost heaves that would cause the observatory to twist and, and deform. For domes, the most common problems seem to be link, uh, leaks around the, the dome itself. But you found that with roll-offs too. We found the rails of our roll-off roof, the water would run along the rail and in, so we put little dams on the rails to prevent that. Vibrations were an issue. This was most commonly found in people who built observatories that had multiple stories to try to get up above the trees to get a better view. And you see here Richard's observatory, he's got this rather massive concrete pillar with 
all kinds of uh, wires and, and steel po posts and stuff to try to get uh, control of that vibration problem. Some people, they put an observatory tower like you see here uh, on their house, but they didn't actually put a pier in. And in this particular case, if you're using the telescope, you have to be very, very still because vibration is a problem. Right after I published my book for the first time, I was approached by Gordon Williams here at one of the general assemblies and he shared pictures of this multiple story tower that he constructed for his telescope to get above the trees and you can see the massive concrete pillar structure that he put in there to to, to make this work another issue and i mentioned 59 uh, percent of the owners are controlling these things from their home they're not actually in the observatory you had people having problems where they were trying to close up quickly because of rain happening or something, and they weren't sure it was in the observatory and they'd have collisions of the roof with the equipment or so on. So you can see solutions like Mike Dodd has here where he has actual signs that indicate the status of the observatory when he looks at the, the camera. So what kind of observatories are being built by amateurs? 95.3% of the observatories built are a dome or a roll-off. It's about a 50-50 split between the two of those. Only 4.7% built something else. So let's go through some of this stuff. Let's look at domes. It goes from the completely collapsible portable dome you see here from Astro Gizmos. I don't, I don't think they're in business anymore, but this is something that rolls up in three kit bags with wheels that you can take away. Two kit observatories like you see with Ray here. This one here, absolutely everything you see was built by Keith Venables. He manufactured the fiberglass panels for the dome. He, he built absolutely everything, including the telescope. Amazing. Most people will, as I've said, buy the telescope, get the equipment, plug everything in, maybe get a dome, maybe build a building for it. It's a, it's a combination of effects. So you think, see things like this. Here's some of the observatories in the Midas Observatory group in Nova Scotia. There's David's uh, observatory that has the barcodes in it on the right there. From Utah, on his garage there, there's the Prince George Center Observatory. They've got a classroom area in the back where they can actually control telescopes that are put on those piers that you see in the foreground in that uh, concrete space. That's uh, where they can set up uh, telescopes in, in uh, cold weather and, and allow people to uh, use their control room inside to control them. This is the Pinhead Observatory. The reason it's called that is because the dome that the octagonal uh, turret is made of uh, foam panels because Steve wanted it to be light. Unfortunately, crows started pecking at it. So we ended up driving a whole bunch of nails through it to, to prevent them from doing this. It's hard to see in this picture, but there's pins sticking out everywhere. Some of these are multiple level domes. Jerry Garber here, he's got his control room down on the main floor with a dome up above. That's the Yukon Center Observatory that, that opened uh, very recently. They've now built a control room next to it, but they have storage on the main floor. Some of them don't look like domes. You saw the Gemma Observatory earlier. Here's another example belonging to Mardina Clark in Washington State. You see it looks like a shed, but the top of the roof is actually a turret, which turns. And some people have the entire building turn. This is John Drummond's Possum Observatory in New Zealand, where the entire building is on the turntable. The other main uh, category is roll-off roofs. Everything from simple converted garden sheds like Greg's shed here, that's the one with the funny sign on the pillar you saw earlier. Uh, some of them are quite uh, elaborate. They have some pretty big equipment in them. Very often you see that they've got interesting truss structures to try to keep the roof up above the door and the equipment inside. This is an example from uh, Joe Meese and his Starfields Observatory in Chiefland, Florida. Here's a Sunshine Coast Center Observatory. Same thing, the door slides over the telescope. And um, we were nominated for the Woodworks 2016 Award, which is a local architectural award in BC for this. It's got a uh, scissors truss to make the roof go up above the equipment. Here's the doghouse observatory. There's the dog. Some 
roll-offs are split. There's actually two roofs that slide. So as you see from Guy's Observatory here in Ontario, you can open one side or the other and basically have a slit that moves back and forth. Barry's Observatory here in Calgary, the roof opens automatically and then the telescope raises up above the roof. Here's one from uh, Colorado, same sort of thing. It's a split roof. It goes off in two directions on rails. But sometimes you've got them where the roof panels slide off to the side with a lever to, to support the thing as it rolls off. Here's an example from Belgium, the Columba Observatory. It's a converted barn, actually. And you have split roll-off buildings. Uh, you see uh, this one here from uh, Damien LeMay in Quebec and Gary's Split Rock Observatory in, in uh, Ontario where the building rolls off and then a panel that goes, that allows the, uh, the pillar to, to, to move into the building is folded down to, so that no one falls through a hole in the floor. We even got this roll off pergola, which is Williams uh, Cave Creek Observatory down in Gold Cal Canyon, Arizona. And of course there's the Astro Closet which is just a very simple box on rails that rolls off on your deck so your telescope is protected when it's not in use. So now let's get into the really interesting ones. This is the Okanagan Center's railway. I love this thing. That's a 25 inch telescope that they built and you see that it's on rails. And if you slide back there, you see there is a uh, freight container that they converted. This is where the thing lives. And when they're ready to use it, they open the doors and they roll the telescope out and then lock it down on the rails. And then when they're done, they roll it back in. Another very common minor category is flip top roofs. This is uh, the vice president of the Sunshine Coast Center in his backyard. He's got this flip top. You'll notice it's completely surrounded by trees. His view of the skies is just straight up overhead. But he manages to do some pretty amazing astrophotography, uh, astrophotography nonetheless. Here's another bat wing style from uh, northern New England, where the roofs uh, fold out to either side. You can see the counterweights. And this is what we would, might call a Pez dispenser. Uh, Basically, this is something that's on the roof of one of the buildings at the University of Victoria, and they use it to cover up their uh, telescopes next to their major telescope, which is in the dome next to it. And this is one of my favorites. It's a tip-over observatory, Sander Poole. Basically, he's taken a garden shed. Uh, he opens the door, he props the door open, and then he tips the whole building over on its back. So I'd briefly like to talk about the robotic telescope. Uh, the RESC has now got this operational down at one of those um, astronomy villages that I told you about. This one right here, Sierra Remote in uh, the Sierra Nevada. And uh, we encourage you to, to use that because it is a very useful piece of equipment. It's now coming online and I'm sure that a lot of people out there, if they can't afford their own observatory, can certainly make use of the equipment that we have available for them. So there's the book. And if you have an observatory, I would love to hear from you because we are constantly trying to keep on top of the latest advances and, and learn from people's mistakes and share this with people. And when this book, uh, when we run out of copies and we reprint a second edition, all of those are gonna be incorporated into it. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, yeah, so now it's uh, time for questions. So uh, either we can have questions through the chat or through the Q&A feature. Um, yeah, so first we'll have uh, questions for Charles and then uh, we'll open up for questions for our other presenters. And if anyone has any other questions to think of later, send me an email. I'll answer it for you, no problem. Jennifer says she's inspired. Thanks, Jennifer. Oh, here we are. 
so do how do you recommend a group of people building an observatory get along with each other? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I've generally found that everybody that's been involved with our own Sunshine Coast Center Observatory have got along with each other. Um, you've got some people that want to do uh, photography. So you have some people that want to do visual observing. Generally, what seems to happen is we have one day of the week where, a uh, Saturday in this case, where if the, there is a sky, we'll have it open for public viewing and someone like me will be running a big telescope and there will be other scopes around and we'll be letting everybody do the, the eyepiece viewing. And then other nights of the week, those are nights where people will go up there and they will plug in the Malin cam and, and put in the equipment and make the thing work for their astrophotography. So you, you can break it down into a schedule where certain interest groups have their, their access to it. We also have groups that will call us like the scouts or, or a homeschool and then we'll have certain nights that will open specially for them, you know, and you can plan that into your schedule, but you can generally get, work out a schedule that works for everybody. What was the budget for the Sunshine Coast Center Observatory? That observatory is about $50,000 all in, you know, when everything's been uh, completed. It was uh, opened in June of 2015 when uh, it wasn't full, it was like operational but not complete and we've been adding stuff. The original roof was a uh, crank system. We now have a motor that was taken out of a, a uh, disabled person's scooter that runs a chain drive so you just press a switch and it rolls off. We also have put in uh, red lighting so that it is uh, easier to get in and out uh, up the, the ramp. It was, from the beginning it was um, disabled access, we have a ramp into the thing. And we have another uh, space in the deck there where we uh, have a pillar underneath where we're hoping to put in another telescope later. And yes, well, actually the question here is, it looks beautiful assuming the labor was mostly sweat equity. About 50% of the work was done by the members of the center, but we had uh, a contractor who was uh, a roofer came in and did the, the metal roofing for us. We had um, Swanson Concrete donated all the concrete. We had the roof rails and the pier were built by Choker Engineering and they didn't charge us for labor, just from materials. So it was a real community project. There were all kinds of different organizations that got involved and you could do that. You can, you can go to the local uh, technical school and see if they'd like to be involved in making your peer because they're learning how to, to, to do metal work and you can talk to various different businesses. The, the worm room that we now have for the observatory was a donation from the Rotary Club. So, you know, all kinds of different input from different uh, parts of the community. It's, it's been a labor of love for us all. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Uh, yeah, there was another question through the Q&A uh, for me. Uh, asking, will the presentations be on YouTube so they can be shared and promote the next session? Uh, yes, we're recording this. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to have it up on YouTube tomorrow, but um, yeah, it will be up. Uh, all these presentations should be available on YouTube soon enough. Uh, Someone's saying, uh, one day I'm going to have one of these. Yeah, call me, Todd. We'll help you out. Uh, yeah, so we got uh, questions coming in for uh, other presenters as well. So we got um, a couple for Matthew. I don't know if uh, you're available, Matthew. I am here. Okay, so there was one before uh, asking if the table of elements would is available. Oh yeah, actually, I just I found it online myself uh, before the presentation because I had remembered that we we talk about that um, astronomers periodic table at the planetarium quite often. Um, literally, I just googled it. If you Google astronomers um, periodic table, you can find that list, and it says where the elements across the table, or rather, how the elements across the table were created. So um, mainly hydrogen, helium, tiny amounts of lithium with the Big Bang, heavier elements created by the deaths of stars. Um, and some other very rare astronomical events, like the collision of neutron stars creates gold, for example. So if you have gold somewhere in your house or in your electronics, the story of that is that at some time in the past, two stars collided together and made gold. It's pretty amazing. Nope, we've got, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, someone mentioning the source of that was uh, Jennifer Johnson from the OSU. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's another question which I think has already been answered. Uh, can we get Esther's presentation printed out? Uh, yeah, I can, um, like if you're looking for the, the wording, because I don't know the audio in there wasn't super good, I can, I can type out a transcript if, that's, if people are looking for that. I, um, I know, um, Gordon, you're saying that you could include like a, a less choppy version of it in the final version too. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll, yeah, and we'll, we'll end up posting that, that video. I also have, have one from Samuela that I'm going to put up on our own YouTube channel for Esther's Echo too. So you can always check yeah, it. I can add subtitles to that as well if it uh, helps. Perfect. Me. Awesome, yeah. Uh, so anyone else have questions for uh, any of our four presenters? It's always the awkward moment waiting for anyone who's typing. I just occurred to me that I when somebody asked about the budget for the observatory, uh, I should have said that we actually funded part of it with a grant from the, from the BC Gaming. And uh, some of it was donation. There was a bequest that was thrown in there, but an awful lot of stuff was donated, as I said. And uh, yeah, we can help people with that sort of stuff too. We have a fundraising expert in the society who can help you with that if you're thinking about it. Yeah, so when did you say the second edition of the book was coming out? Well, we're running out of copies of the um, first edition, and I'm going to, when we have our next meeting of the publishing uh, committee, I'm going to be uh, talking with the uh, editorial board about uh, putting a new one out. It's, it's going to have some uh, new information, it's new pictures, and uh, maybe next year. We'll see. All right. Yeah, so we'll give a couple more minutes for people who have any questions. Uh, yes, you can either do it through the chat or through the Q&A window. While we're waiting, I'm gonna throw in a plug. Last night, my center had uh, Dr. Jess MacGyver from LIGO uh, talk to us on Zoom and it was a fabulous meeting. I know she's one of your presenters for uh, GA Light uh, next Saturday. If you haven't uh, heard her speak, check it out. It's really, really, she's really, really good. Okay. Oh, here's a question uh, for Matthew. From how far out in the solar system was the pale blue dot of Earth taken? Yeah, um, great question. I'm pretty sure it's about 6 billion kilometers. Um, so as, as far as I know, it's still the most distant photo taken. Um, and uh, if you, uh, on Netflix, I don't know if it's still there, but there is a documentary called The Farthest, and it talks about the Voyager spacecraft, the two of them. That was taken by Voyager 1, I believe, but, um, and how they are the most distant human-made objects that are out there in the universe. And, uh, and this, there's a, an interesting story in the documentary about that particular picture because um, NASA was kind of uh, unwilling to, to do the photo because there wasn't like any direct scientific use for it. So they're like, well, why? Like, they were about to turn off the camera to save power because Voyager was so far out in space, there's not really anything for it to take pictures of anymore. Some of the first images we have of, uh, and some of the clearest of the planets in our own solar system came from that probe. It was like an astonishing close up view of the planets we never really had before. Um, and so uh, they're like, okay, well, let's turn it off. And it was Carl Sagan who rushed over and was like, no, 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 like, let's do this picture and, and the pale blue dot image is actually part of a, a larger uh, mosaic of images that's called the, the solar system family. And you can see uh, a bunch of the, of, the, of the planets all in those photos, including Earth. Um, and the one that I showed is actually an updated version. I, I believe it was like a, an anniversary edition that just came out this year um, that took the original raw data from the picture and it was reprocessed with modern day techniques because the, the original one's a little bit noisier and grainier than that one. Uh, but yeah, most distant image of the Earth ever taken. Photo Earth taken by chance from 
Saturn, the Cassini spacecraft. Yeah, actually, um, when that one was taken, um, they had, it was either, it was either NASA or JPL, but they ran like a, a social media competition where everyone said like, uh, that were, it was called like, we're photobombing Saturn. Uh, so they knew that they were taking the image from behind where there was going to be, like, you know, Saturn was eclipsing the sun and so you're gonna have all this light filtering through uh, the rings and you can see the, the blue dot of earth in that picture. And so they were telling people that when that photo was being released to like wave, wave that day, they're like having everyone go up and then take their, their own pictures, like selfies of themselves waving up at the Cassini probe and post them online. Uh, Cause it was like the day that earth was photobombing Saturn. So it was, it was a, it was a neat project uh, way to get everyone involved online that way. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't see any further questions. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank all of our panelists today. Uh, so Ian, Marina, Matthew, and Charles, thank you all very much for the presentations you gave today. Uh, yeah, um, I think most, if not all of you, gave your email addresses. So if anyone has any further questions, uh, they can contact each of you directly. But uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone for showing up today. Uh, so our reminder, our next session is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, so the address for that is available on our website and on Meetup. So, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for attending today and, uh, we will see you all tomorrow. Oh yes. 11 AM Vancouver time as someone has noted. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and, uh, thanks very much for coming. <laughs>